anyway, Rod, let's talk about these regulations. Uh, we talked with Stephen Skinner uh, earlier in regards to PFAS because he's involved in the lawsuits that uh, were as a result of the foam and the firefighting yeah. foam at the uh, VA, at the fire department there. What's going to change with these regulations and when do they take effect? Yeah, it's a, so it's a longstanding issue and, and one that I'm working at at a national level, but there's so much local apl applicability because of the challenges that Martinsburg has had specifically over the last decade or so. Um, let me just sort of take a step back and say, you know, PFAS has been commonly used for decades in industrial products, commercial products, um, most commonly uh, firefighting foam, which is where the issue ar you know, arose at the Air, Air Guard base here in Berkeley County. Um, but there are significant health effects as a result of these chemicals, um, mm -hmm. you know, cancer, uh, uh, cholesterol levels, immune suppression, et cetera. And so um, the, the Biden administration and EPA um, just two or three weeks ago finalized the first ever national drinking water standard that will require public drinking water systems to meet um, specific levels to ensure um, that, that uh, the public health is protected as, result, as a result of these chemicals. There's about 66,000 public drinking water systems in the United States that will now be need to comply. Now, there is a runway to get there. Um, systems will have three years to test and monitor. Um, Martinsburg will be ahead of the curve because of un the unfortunate issue back in 2016. I think Martinsburg is already monitoring, um, but all other systems across the country will need to be monitoring and testing. And then within two years after that, so five years from now, um, any new you know, capital investments or technology to help uh, um, eliminate those chemicals would have to be in place. So there's a little bit of time to get there, um, but uh, this is the first time that these standards have ever been set nationwide. What was your involvement with these standards, Rod? I sit on EPA's um, PFAS Council, which is all the senior leaders that are uh, kind of working together and uh, you know on these issues. Um, as head of the Office of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, most of my time is spent looking at um, implications for the food and ag sector. So. PFAS potentially showing up in, in food. So I work closely with FDA and USDA on that side of it. But also um, I try to keep an eye out for rural drinking water systems that might have less uh, you know, capital uh, capacity, and basically less funding to help uh, meet standards. How do we make sure that there's flexibility built in or time to meet the standards? So I was kind of looking out for those types of communities and stakeholders throughout the conversation. I'm not a chemist like my father. You all know my dad, former Senator Herb Snyder, he's mm -hmm. a chemist. I'm not a technical guy, I'm a policy person. So I was there as part of the PFAS Council, um, just bringing that either ag or rural perspective to the table. All right, very good. Mr. Heights. So let's talk a little bit about how um, to get the PFAS out of drinking yep. water. What are the technologies? Um, you say Martinsburg's ahead of the curve because of the, the issues we've had here. What have we done technology-wise, and, and what do we have to do to continue to meet the new regulations? Yeah, it's, so first of all, as I understand it, back uh, what I've read is that back in 2016, the levels that were found here were 114 parts per trillion of PFOS and 46 parts per trillion of PFOA. The new standard is four parts per trillion for each. So now I'm not that was before it was being treated, right? So that sure. the, the, the the levels were were quite high. That. Um, that drinking water well was actually taken offline for a year or two to get it into uh, to get it up to uh, up to standard. Um, I don't know specifically which technology Martinsburg adopted, but you've got granular activated carbon treatment, you've got reverse osmosis, ion exchange systems. There's a variety of um, treatment systems on the market that um, municipal water drinking water systems can choose from, um, and they're you know varying degrees of expense and whatnot. But you're right, Martinsburg is ahead of the game in that regard because they did adopt this. I think they may have the granular carbon, um, but but they adopted that back in 2017 to meet um, to basically get those levels below. Um, those those high levels from 2016. So and now the 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 causes of that PFAS in the drinking water here, specifically here in Berkeley County, you say 167th and the fire yeah. suppression foams, um, those things. So once they get into the ground and the ground water, is there a period of time it takes to get them back out of the water? Or is this like a forever thing? Well, they're called forever chemicals because they don't break down in the environment easily. Sure. Um, and, and that's the difficulty with this specific contaminant is that they don't break down. So um, 
I, from my understanding, uh, the Air Guard does not use these specific firefighting foams any longer, and there's many um, bases across the country that are trying to phase this out because of the environmental problems. Um, but if it's in the groundwater, it, it can be there a very, very long time, um, which is why you know cities and towns do need to start testing across the country. Now, we, we think somewhere between 6 and 10% of public drinking water systems nationwide might need to take some steps um, if they are perhaps near an Air Guard base or near a manufacturing facility where these chemicals were used. So. Um, they can persist in the groundwater for a long time, so that's why we got a, a step up monitoring. Is it just air guard bases, or was it uh, the, was this a an uh, an airport thing? Airport thing as well. Um, and yes. So any airport. That's right. So um, if you're near airports where this pro product would have been used, it could be a groundwater issue. Um, the Department of Defense, though, specifically is obviously very aware of, of this, and in, at least in Marsburg's case, I understand DoD. Um, reimbursed the city $5 million to help pay for the treatment costs back in 2019. So um, the Department of Defense is, is very engaged in these conversations as well. Okay. Mr. Harvey. Good morning, Rod. Um, what about people on wells? Yep. How, how do they, is there going to be resources available for them to test their own water? Yes, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that Congress passed and President Bi Biden signed back in 2022, I think, um, there was around $20 billion total in drinking water um, um, improvement funding. Now, most of that is going to go towards public drinking water systems, but there is going to be around $1 billion pot that will be accessible for private wells also. I, what we're encouraging folks on private wells to start out with, if, if it's, a, it's a concern or if you're near perhaps that part of the county, you know, um, is just start by testing to just figure out what you're dealing with as a baseline. And there are um, home um, treatment systems that you can purchase. Um, EPA's website, if you Google it, EPA's website, you can look at um, PFAS treatment systems that are for in-home uses. Um, they're available in the market as well. Uh, and so if first start by testing to know if you have a problem and then you, there are options available. Are there in-home testing test? systems? What's that? Are there in-home no, testing systems? No, you need systems? to use a certified lab, and so gotcha. um, that's all. That some of that avail that information is available through EPA and probably through state DEP as well. You uh, PFAS testing is very tricky because you can get false positives quite easily. So you've got to make sure that you're using a, a certified lab to to get those results. And and this is not one of those things that you would just treat your drinking water, but not the gray water for the for your showers correct you would want to treat I, I, yeah i would think that just generally you want to treat for all water coming into your house if you if, yeah and it's not that every well in the eastern panel is going to have a problem but if you do find one there are at least solutions available you want to treat all the water coming into your house and is there uh, maybe maybe just answer that is there is there some sort of reimbursable for if you have if you do have an elevated pfas in your your well water to to remy to secret remediation yeah the mo most of the funding through the law was for public systems but there is about a billion that is a, a pot okay. that will be available nationwide um, to help address private wells also um, we can there's information on EPA's website about that and then we work closely with Western Union DEP on all of these drinking water issues and so um, you can also reach out to the state uh, you know if you've got questions about potential financial um, uh, resources Rod Snyder is our guest director of the Office of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Uh, earlier this month, the Biden administration signed into law regulations that will alleviate some of the PFAS situations that we are having uh, to deal with around the country here. Uh, what is the ramp up period you mentioned, Rod, in terms of making some of these uh, areas come into compliance? So there's a three-year monitoring schedule that basically around the country folks have three years to start either I think quarterly testing is, is required for most systems um, if they weren't doing it before. And then after that three-year period, if they know, if they determine that they're above the, the levels, uh, then they will have two years to then make the capital investments to meet the standards. So it's basically five years from finalization of the rule. So we're talking about spring of 2029. The entire country should be you know reaching that point. And look, that's 100 million customers, really, if you think about it nationwide, that would have um, much less exposure to PFAS in their drinking water. So from a public health perspective, this is a pretty dramatic benefit um, over time that we think that, you know, the public, quite frankly, clean drinking water is one of the most important things that we can offer the, the public. So this is, I think, a critical step forward. And, and this is not specific to just the Biden administration. EPA has been 
working towards this for years and years, but we were able to finally get this done this this uh, this spring. This, this kind of goes back to the Aaron Brockovich movie uh, from like 25 years ago, doesn't it? Uh, 20 years ago, whatever it was, where you're dealing with something that's in your water supply that you can't necessarily smell or see? Yeah, but even more specifically, the dark water movie that Mark Ruffalo was in, uh, which, which, was is West, frightening. which is West Virginia yeah. based. Yes. And, and that was actually PFAS. That was the same exact chemical that we're talking about today. And uh, that movie was very compelling. And folks who are on the Western side of the state have lived through that. And that's yeah. because of a manufacturing facility right there on the river. Uh, and so this is real. And West Virginia has really tangled with this um, over over the years. So we really have to get ahead of it. And I think this new rulemaking is uh, a critical step forward. And the fire foam you, you talked about, is that also made by DuPont? I know the other, when we talked about the dark water, the the PFAS was made by DuPont, and they took on some responsibility. You talked about the DOT making payments to, to Martinsburg. Is DuPont itself responsible for any of this uh, nationwide? There's been some litigation in recent years. I try not to... Uh call out specific companies sure. or get those folks. You know, we got some lawyers here at the table. I try to avoid the <laughs> uh, avoid that side of it. But yeah, some of the companies are beginning to enter into settlements um, to address this uh, from, from legacy contamination. Um, and, and that should help over time as well. Okay. Do we know from a safety standpoint what ex- an acceptable parts per million would be? You had said four. Trillion. Was, was trillion. Was trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Or parts yeah. per trillion, sorry. Yeah, yeah you had said four previously but do we know that for scientific fact yes so the the, we have toxicologists i mean epa has lots of scientists in our office of research and development we work with other national labs um to to look at um health impacts of a variety of of chemistries pfas is a class of chemicals that are there's thousands of them actually so um there were only six specific compounds that uh, this drinking water rule touches PFOA and PFOS are two of the most common, and they were both in the Martinsburg situation. Um, they're the most studied. And so we do know what those health Im- impacts are. And and um, four parts per trillion, admittedly, is quite low. Um, that's around the level of detection. But basically what the toxico- toxicologists have told us is that, especially for drinking water, because everybody's drinking, if you're drinking eight glasses a day, you're consuming a lot of water. Um, at that low level, it can have health impacts. So essentially that is at the level of detection right mm-hmm. now basically that's if that's how we can confidently detect that there is pfas there is about four parts per trillion which is where we set the standard and this is not a natural compound these it is are not. these are man-made compounds these are man-made compounds okay. that do not exist in nature uh they're only through these manufacturing processes are yeah. the you say there's six that are covered by these regulations in regards to the others are are they working toward those as well yeah we're clearly there's still research and work going underway um particularly we'll start with some we've been starting with the most common the most studied and then we'll work from there we also don't want to set standards for things that we don't have data on yet so that's part of the the scientific process and the agency will continue to look at other opportunities to make improvements but we started with where we have data when you do a study like this and you, you you get data for it, how long is the period of time before you feel like you have enough before you can go public with some changes? That's a good question. I mean, I know the agency has been studying this for you know a number of years, better part of a decade or more. Um, and that's uh, going for, I'm, again, I'm not a chemist. I don't know how many years I got to sit, sit in the lab, but I know that it, it took many years to get to the point where this final rule was issued. It does not happen overnight. It does take a lot of evidence-based you know, fact-finding. Is there a difference between rural and city in regards to any of this legislation as to where more of the funding is going or needed even? Great question. So um, rural drinking water systems are are typically defined as 10,000 or fewer um, customer, members of the population that are served. So rural drinking water systems, think of that as a 10,000 cutoff, which means there's a lot in the Eastern Panhandle that are at, under that level. Um, there are specific, there's another billion dollar pot of funds that is specifically for small and rural systems that we can sort of carve out and dedicate to those small systems. And it, it's necessary because the ratepayer base is a lot smaller in those towns and communities, and they may need help to help make those capital investments. Um, and then the other thing is um, we have a slightly reduced uh, monitoring burden on those smaller systems just because we know it, it's an extra cost. So I think we're just twice a year they can test in order to, to meet the standard, whereas a larger system would need to test more frequently. These are just flexibilities we're trying to build in just to make sure that these small towns can actually you know, do this. 
What are, what are the, the physical ramifications of PFAS poisoning? How would you recognize that you, you have been uh, poisoned by these, and what are the symptoms, and, and, and how do you correct that? Well, I, 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 you're getting into uh, areas that I'm not an expert for sure, but, but you know, we have read and I've read that, that you know, various forms of cancer, so immunosuppression problems, um, uh, high cholesterol, um, I- if folks feel that they, you know, they have potential concerns, you know, you should talk to your doctor, first of all. What's interesting about Berkeley County is that I believe the CDC has actually been doing blood testing um, with a number, has been doing sampling over the last several years, looking at elevate, potential uh, evidence of elevated PFAS and, and bloodstreams here in this county. That's actually worth looking up on the internet as well. It's on you know official CDC website, um, the results of that study, because it can give you a sense for how, you know, how prevalent it is in this particular area. Mr. Harvey. Uh, if, if you're a rural area and you don't have any manufacturing or a, or any sort of air bases, uh, is it still wise to test the water, or is it required? It's um, for wells or for for the system. For, for both. Well, for, it, it will now be required for all public drinking water systems, no matter where you are in the country, and, and it, it, it it will be part. It is part of the the rule um, for for wells. Yeah, I mean, if you're not anywhere near any potential sources, it's probably less risk, right? Um, but but for public drinking water systems, it was now part of the okay. requirements. For certain reasons that uh, I cannot say, this next person must remain anonymous, but they have texted me this, Rod. The Martinsburg situation arose because the EPA changed the legal limits of PFAS enforcement. The Guard and the city were not negligent in any way under the guidelines that existed at the time. I lived in the affected area for 15 years and participated in the monitoring project the CDC did in the aftermath. Uh, It was high for some types of PFAS, but low for some others and not close to the 95th percentile. So I certainly would not suggest that the city of Martinsburg was negligent. Uh, by, I hope I didn't suggest that. And that's not that. from Mayor yeah. Kevin Knowles, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think Martinsburg did all the right things and followed all the guidance. And it's true that at the time, the, the health advisories did change, but that's because of new science. And, and if the agency is aware of risks to the public as a result of chemicals, we have to introduce that new science. Um, and so uh, Marsburg responded to that and did the right thing and bought, you know, brought in the treat- treatment technologies even before they had the $5 million reimbursement mm-hmm. from, from DOD. So um, I think Martinsburg did all the right things to protect their customers and protect the public, and I would give them all the credit in the world for that. It was not negligence. The science has improved and we've become more aware of these risks, and we do introduce new standards. The drinking water standards that were finalized this month um, are even more conservative yet. And so it will take time for folks to cross the country to meet those. But I think it's still the right thing as a matter of public health. Um, when we become aware of this information, it's best for the agency to finalize these standards. We had uh, attorney Stephen Skinner on recently regarding the uh, PFAS and the uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa texted us some information on PFAS legislation that was passed by the House yeah. uh, and the uh, Senate as well. One of the things Stephen pointed out was it's not just drinking the water. The water can be absorbed into your body. PFAS can be absorbed into your, into your skin simply by touching it, coming into contact with it as well, which is the reason why just having a drinking water filter at your faucet, for instance, isn't as good as having an entire whole home filter uh, because you've got to filter this stuff out. Uh, can it be filtered out to a safe enough level? Rod, yes, if, yes. You, if you go by the EPA guidelines as to what to buy? The technologies exist, and, and that's something that the agency has to take into consideration when we are finalizing things under the Safe Drinking Water Act, is what is technolo- technologically feasible and achievable. And so the fact that there is uh, on the market today these types of technologies that help to meet the standard, they exist. Um, that allows us to proceed with the actual rulemaking. If the technology doesn't exist, it'd be foolish for the agency to suggest that we have to reach levels that is simply not possible. So um, the, those technologies that I mentioned, the, the granular activated carbon, et cetera, um, are very effective at helping to, to get the chem- chemicals out of the water. And that's, that's a good thing. 
Were you involved in the legislation in any way as an expert witness, so to speak, or did you in, in put any, uh, import any information to the legislature when they were discussing this recent law? In West Virginia? Yes. No, I did not uh, get involved in those state-level conversations. I was certainly interested in it and monitoring it as a, as a citizen, as a resident of Jefferson County, uh, but I didn't, I didn't directly get involved in that. Mike, were you involved in any of those meetings? No, no, not at all. Um, however, when when we do filter these things out, whether it's through reverse osmosis or the granulated uh, carbon, um, how often do those things have to be, those filters have to be changed out? And, and then what do they do with them? How do you make sure that we're not putting this back into the environment? Yeah, the agency also just released destruction and disposal guidance for PFAS, which is a bigger issue for larger quantities, of course, but landfills now um, are getting better guidance on how to manage these contaminants as well, because we do need to look at this holistically. It's sure. not just water. Um, and so that guidance just came out about around the same time as the new drinking water standard. Um, I do not know the answer on how frequently the filters need to be changed, but landfills are getting up to speed as well on the new guidance for how they manage these materials from a solid waste perspective. Mm -hmm. Rod, I want to thank you so much for coming in and your department for making you available for this conversation. Thanks for having me. I'm always happy to come on, Rob. Great stuff. Looks like you are uh, doing good work there. Thanks. <laughs>